Today's episode is called Borders, Portals, and Invisible Suits. And by that title, it is divided into three parts. There'll be timestamps below. The first part will be about borders and division. Second part, portals. And the third part, invisible suits. It's inspired from comments by Count Dubleve, not just on my previous video on the offering, the caveat, the sacrifice, and the door, but he also left a comment on a video I made over a year ago. And let me just read to you what he said. So on the, the most recent video, he said, in line with this, a video I consider to be an honoring of abstraction and how abstraction can objectively play out onto a reality. I would like for you to share your thoughts on borders. And I mean all the different kinds of borders. So for instance, literal borders like the Rio Grande or borders created by the fourth wall in movies or television shows. Cellular walls, the space between thought and words spoken. What is the restraint to take a drink or a smoke a cigarette? That first clumsy clutch under a brazier. Borders, crossing them legally or otherwise. What are your thoughts on borders? I had borders as a child. They were lines that I wasn't supposed to cross, like crossing the street or crossing the tree line so that I wouldn't fall into the lake. But these were imaginary borders that were set by my parents. And my mind believed that those borders were actually there and I obeyed them. And then on the video from a year ago, which almost feels like the sequel or the prequel to the one I just read, is he says, I wish for you to expound on your ideas concerning individuality. And then in parentheses, he says, in divide duality, which is pretty, I never even noticed that. Division has gotten a real bad rap these days. Things like greater than divided symbol, as a Christian, I love division. Division is mentioned more than a few times on the first page of my Bible. When I think of it, uh, when I read the first page of Genesis, the firmament divides the oceans, or divide the waters. Specific language matters. Division happened at Babel. Moses worked toward the division of his people away from the enslavement in Egypt. Best of all that comes to mind, when someone came and said that surely Jesus had come to unify, he corrected them by saying he had come as a sword to divide. Yep, I dig division. When I think of unity, I think of an old buddy, this, this, this part. So when I think of unity, I think of an old buddy of mine that used to order food and then mix everything up on his plate into one big pile of slop and say, hey, it all goes down the same pipe anyway. I just don't like eating my food that way. Nope, I like things separated, enjoyed separately, the way the chef intended. No, sir, I don't like it. Both of those were excellent comments. I've been thinking of those in the back of my mind for over a year. Well, the new one recently and, and that one. So division and borders, those are the concepts Count Dubuve presents. The first thing I'll bring up is the law of NIMBY. The law of NIMBY isn't really used anymore, but in the 1980s, I used to hear the adults talk about it all the time that were in politics. So the law of NIMBY, NIMBY is an acronym for not in my backyard. And recently, over the last couple years, we've seen the law of NIMBY on full display when Ron DeSantis and Governor Abbott from Texas sent migrants to Martha's Vineyard, Chicago, New York, and other cities that were sanctuary cities. And so all of these sanctuary cities over all the last decade have been able to virtue signal their altruism by saying, oh, we're a sanctuary city. We're better than you. Yeah, you racist little states. We're a sanctuary city. And come to find out, <laughs> they don't really want it. So, uh, not in my backyard. It's like, oh yeah, uh, all for one, one for all, just not in my backyard. They like their borders. They like their walls. They like their police force creating a border. They also create invisible borders. I'll link this one to you guys. 
landscaping is a mind control tactic. And uh, actually, I'll just leave that at there. I don't want to fully give away the secret of landscaping, but landscaping is a form of a border known as a deterrent. So deterrents are also borders. Lights, well-lit areas also create a border in the form of a deterrent. On my album, Mind Over Matrix, in 2003 to 2005, I had a song called They Don't Want to Know. And in it, it says, Oh, I believe in raising taxes. Just don't raise them on me. <laughs> oh yeah, everybody come in, but just not into my neighborhood. Oh yeah, we, we need to have an airport built, but not in my backyard. We need a new high-speed train rail system. Okay, sir, uh, could we put the, the tracks for that rail in your backyard? Oh, no, not in my backyard. <laughs> your backyard, but not my backyard. I think the wisdom of what Count Dublave is trying to say is that while it doesn't sound good to have division and borders, the reality is we all, no matter who you are, even the guy that mixes all of his food into one big slop because it all goes down the same pipe, you create borders when you write to space words out, okay? To, to space words is you're dividing. You're dividing the sentence into individual words so that you can read them more easily. Sure, you could just bunch them all together, but then it becomes a lot harder to tell the difference between one word to the next. I mean, all those words go into your eyes anyway, right? Who cares if they're spaced out? The street and the sidewalk are borders. In the United States, the majority of people want a door of some sort on bathrooms and bathroom stalls and restrooms or whatever you want to call them. People like the privacy of a door. Now, there are some people that like to just go out in public with no shame. And so the borders and the division isn't for them. Don't you want to divide where we place human waste? There are some places that don't divide where human waste goes. And they're called s-holes. So to Count Dublave, my answer is, yeah, not in my backyard. The division, the borders, not in my backyard. And yes, to philosophize about what, can, what actually is a border and what is division, it's actually quite it's quite a thought process and I, I could go through all that I'm, that's not my kind of thing that I do where you know I mind map every single possibility of what a division and what a border is but I do recognize the concept is quite brilliant and I want to pass it on to the audience sure division sounds bad but if there was no division there'd be no sports of opposing teams or individual matches division is part of life and borders the way it was put to us in college it was that there are legal borders which are man-made but there are also physical borders such as mountain chains such as oceans you know so there are actual natural borders that really do exist even if they are not legally defined and then that actually goes to what was in the comment was an abstraction of what a abstract border is versus a physical border. It also makes me think of one of the new age phrases that I never liked. I just don't like when people say, we are all one. And actually, I did put that on that same Mind Over Matrix album. I said, we are all one. My feet attached to the ground that you walk on. My soul emerged with yours and each and every one. But mm, I, don't, I think we're different. Not everybody's the same. We are not all one. Yeah, sure, we are all one human species. The thing is, I don't identify as, I mean, I am a human being currently. I am a human being or being, I'm being human. But, you know, I'm a spirit inhabiting a body and I'm not even saying that in the new agey sense I'm a spirit inhabiting a body no dude check my channel out I remember choosing my life in another dimension and so when I look in the mirror I'm just like people think this is who I am 
like this, then it's not. Perhaps what the great count was driving towards is the duality of individualism versus collectivism. Now, I do like working on a team for some things, but I absolutely love my individuality. I have enforced, not enforced, but forced my individuality on the world throughout my life. I've always rejected conforming to the rules and the narrative of the group, of the collective. I am my own person with my own thoughts and my own system and my own moral code. And now, if I agree with the narrative or the code of ethics of the group, then I will adopt it, but I will not surrender to it. Many people surrender to the cult of the clique of the group in order to belong. I don't have any desire to belong. I'm kind of <laughs> like the way I kind of just like, I'm like, man, you got to be my friend. <laughs> like, if you don't want to be my friend, there's something wrong with you, not me. And the people that don't want to be my friends, generally there is something wrong with them. They either want to be sinful in their sinful ways. Uh, they don't want the reminder of my standard of excellence forced upon them all the time. They don't want to live up to my standards. And that's fine. That's fine if they don't want to do that. But they got to realize that the fault is with them, not me. <laughs> I have standards. In the 80s, there was a phrase that has been abandoned, and the phrase was the pursuit of excellence. Nobody says that anymore, but that used to be a phrase that I heard often as a child. And I haven't heard the phrase the pursuit of excellence in like at least 20 years. In fact, the pursuit of excellence was even like a slogan you'd see printed on television. Corporations would want to talk or engineering companies would say we are in the pursuit of excellence. And I do remember when all that went away. Part of the shift began in 89, but then a massive shift began in 92, 93, to the point where this pursuit of excellence was expected for all the children, all the students. And, you know, kids would be concerned, like, I have to excel on this exam. I have to get an A. I have to do all these great things. I have to live up to a standard. And then in the 92, 93 year, I remember the teachers came in, they said, hey, you know, we've been uh, overworking you all and stressing many of you out. The reality is not everybody's gonna grow up to be the president. Not everybody's going to be a doctor or a lawyer. And so uh, we're gonna ease some of the requirements down for you uh, because we don't want to damage your poor little minds and stress you all, all you young children out. And so concepts like deadlines no longer became deadlines. And it was almost encouraged by some of the teachers where they would say, oh, you know, when the there was a deadline, when, some, when an assignment was due, it was almost like there was a coordinated effort by some of the students to not turn it in on time to create a majority of the democracy that didn't turn it in. And so the teacher would say, oh my, it looks like all of you children just didn't have enough time to complete your assignment. I don't know, I guess I'll have to extend that deadline out by another week. What do you say, kids? Yeah! And there began the erosion, there began the decline of excellence. It no longer became the pursuit of excellence, it actually became how can we diminish excellence and bring down standards. Bring down the standards is what they wanted to do. Also want to tell you, another four years later on in training for media, they told us and I need you to believe this. This Most of the time I'll say do your own homework, but you're not going to be able to find this information out there because it's kind of like an industry secret. But they in 99, 2000, 2001, they said, we will not broadcast anything on television that is above an eighth grade reading level or education level. So everything on television literally is there to 
dumb, dumb you down if you've gotten beyond the eighth grade. They'll say it's for profits to make sure that the eighth grade level, everybody achieves at least eighth grade. And so you're not alienating the audience, but that seems like a convenient cover. They always seem to use profits as the cover. That's just business. It's just business. Anyone that is not in the pursuit of excellence and is trying to prevent you to go in the pursuit of excellence is by definition trying to hold you down. Let's bring back the phrase, the pursuit of excellence, and for yourself, beyond the pursuit of excellence. Even myself, I've let down my standards of the pursuit of excellence just due to the fact that the degradation of standards has been so overwhelming that your initial upbringing, the initial conditioning, even for myself, begins to wear off. So standards have declined tremendously and as the standards decline, so does the society. So if people are wondering, what happened to our society? Well, you lowered the standards for everything. And if you lower the standards for everything, what do you expect the outcome is gonna be? And if you think this is the first time that's ever been tried, this is a repeating cycle. And when they say history repeats itself, you might just think it's some natural cause of events. No, history repeats itself because <laughs> we are in a completely controlled environment that masterminds are psychologically manipulating us to do whatever it is that they want. I also wanted to say this, and I may make a video about this. The study of economics is not the study of the distribution of scarce goods. The more I thought this when I was in school, but now that I'm older and less naive, it is the study of the levers of control. Okay, all those supply and demand charts, you might think it's for supply and demand or profit and loss. No, no, no. These are all the control levels, levers, levers, levers. They have all different kinds of levers to make, to, to be able to control you just in case a surplus should ever break out in any, any sector. And that's why they tell you the basket of goods. Uh, they make it sound like it's to your benefit. Oh, well, you know, sometimes if, if the price of one good goes up, the price of another good will come down. That's the basket of goods. That's the basket of goods. And yet, yeah, but if you reverse it, mm -hmm, if the price of something goes down, the price of something else will go up. And this is the invisible caste system. So instead of having, I don't know what the, the, the Hindu India caste system levels are, but our caste system is the lower class, the middle class, and the upper class. As far as division goes, in my clothing, I like to separate my socks from my underwear, from my shirts, and I divide them. I segregate my socks and my underwear and my shirts and my pants and my dress shirts and my dress pants and my suits. I divide them all. They're all divided. Now, I have seen some friends that don't like that division. They don't like organizing and they just throw all their clothes into a giant pile. And hey, if that's what they want to do, they should be allowed to do that in their own area that they control. But in the area that I control, I don't want to be forced into removing my division and having to just slop everything together into one big pile. I too love the division. I am an organizational fanatic. I love dividing things. I love having separate drawers for separate things. I like to isolate a drawer to a singular type of item. So I have a pens and pencils drawer. I have a drawer for all my microphones, a drawer for all my cables, but those cables are multiple drawers. So one drawer is just all USB cables. One is all HDMI cables. One is all VGA cables. One is all network cables and so on. Some people, when they see my organization, it kind of frightens them. I guess it's because once again, it's a standard of excellence that they don't want to live up to. They see the organization that I maintain 
and that I the system that I put in place and I guess they don't want to live up to that and that's fine I'm not trying to enforce that on them I'm actually trying to say hey look how well I have everything organized if you ask for something or if we need something I could instantaneously find it because I have an organizational system of where I could and I do that because I want to be able to find whatever it is rapidly I, I want to increase the efficiency of my inventory I want to know where all things are at all times and if I can't if there's so many items I need to just know where I could find them for instance like a file cabinet okay a file cabinet is a form of division you are dividing things by alphabet by address but there's so many different ways Excel Microsoft Excel a spreadsheet divides data into types into sets into organizational things active well active director you guys might not know but databases we have division in all forms and it's not necessarily just to say you're different it's to make things easier to organize it's to put order to the chaos yes the order out of chaos but that isn't to say let's let's manufacture a crisis in order to create a new order I'm not saying that I'm saying hey we got a bunch of things we need to categorize all right now the same people that that say oh division is bad they also like the animals and they don't mind the division of mammals and crustaceans and reptiles and amphibians oh no to know that division that's a sign of hey, hey look at me so there is division in the world there's division of the land and the sea division of the sky division is okay it's not necessarily a bad thing borders are not necessarily a bad thing borders prevent water from flooding if you say you don't want borders then if you want to eat cereal you have to just not use a bowl because a bowl is a a border and it contains the liquid of the milk same with soup if you want to contain the liquid you have to use some form of a border to uh, prevent that liquid from naturally flowing how it normally would because it wants to just like gases so there you go liquid solids and gases those are forms of division what are you gonna say that that water is just water and that it's not a gas it's not water vapor and it's not an ice cube division exists naturally it's not a man-made thing it's not simply a Hegelian dialectic now divide and conquer is an evil thing to do because that is creating artificial division so I'm in favor of organizational division eh, even that can get tainted so yeah where do we draw the line on division and that's that intersection my tools get divided I got my screwdrivers my hammers my nails my screws my drill bits so yes I divide things I think we've beaten this little division border thing to the T so I'm gonna move on to the next topic the next topic is portals and while portals seem exciting you might watch Rick and Morty and love his portals you might have played the video game portal you might have thought of portals over the years through science fiction films and they seem exciting they seem glamorous they seem like a form of time travel but borders portals are spooky dangerous <laughs> and you really got to think it through and through dreams I've had the reality of portals brought to me so just recently I had this dream of this I met this engineer in my dream and he created a realistic looking portal like it was like a Rick and Morty portal but it wasn't a cartoon it was what a portal would look like if you had to use matter and reality to create it so not even the way it would appear in a science fiction film but how it would appear realistically organically organically is not the right word but uh, materially okay and he explained what the how this is actually what he said <laughs> I saw his portal and I said yo you this is a portal and he said yeah and I said how did you how did you make this portal and he first explained that 
Well, actually, let me tell you what he said, the insult. He said, hey, so, so I asked him, how did you make the portal? And he goes, hey, what Super Bowl are you guys on right now? 58? And I, I was like, yeah, they don't even name it by the number. They just use, like, the Roman numbers. He goes, yeah, they use the Roman, the Roman numerals, huh? Because that's the bread and circus, right? And I was like, yeah, 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 yeah. But, yeah, I'm watching the Super Bowl, okay? I'm going to I like the Chiefs. I like the 49ers. He's like, yeah, yeah, so you guys are on Super Bowl 58, right? And I'm like, yeah. He goes, so that means you've had 58 years of Super Bowls because you do them annually, right? And I was like, yeah, 58 years of Super Bowls. He's like, yeah, yeah. So you want to know how I made this portal, right? And I say, yeah, that's, that was my question, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, I would like to know how you made your portal. Yeah, the way we made this portal is uh, the last 58 years when you were watching the stupid Super Bowl, we were working on figuring out how the atom works, how matter works, how molecules work. We were figuring out how the micro world worked right under your nose while you were sitting there watching a stupid TV set. And I'm like, uh, sir, I'm only 45 years old. I wasn't alive for 58 years. He's like, no, 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 your people, your people in your little farm colony of the farm animals that you all are. Yeah, you've been watching the stupid football and sports, and it's not just football. You guys watch soccer, you watch baseball, you watch all the stupid stuff and you don't pay. You spend all the time on that instead of spending time figuring out how the world you actually live in works, okay? So yeah, while you were doing that stupid, mindless, dumb, moronic activity, staring at a TV set, we were figuring out how the world actually works. Not just the world, but the subatomic, the invisible level, how the matter is actually structured, what is the essence of matter, how the matter interacts with each other, the chemistry of it all, the intricacies of how the matter is structured and how to manipulate this matter. And we found things out and we can control this matter and we found that the matter isn't just in this realm, but when you start to manipulate the matter in ways that your mind couldn't even comprehend, you could create things like this portal here. And he's like, take a look at that portal. Isn't that a marvel? Isn't that blowing your mind? And I'm looking at it and I'm like, that is some creep. It was, go all right, try to describe what it looked like. It was like gold, like, like gold pixels almost, but, but not pixels. Like it was all like, it, it, was, it was all merging with itself. So it was, it looked consistent. It almost looked like quicksand, but it had like pixels and there was a like gradients of color. So think of sand, like glowing, not, yeah, like glowing sand. But some of them, it wasn't just gold. There was also like gray, golden gray. It looked cool. It, it looked like some Egyptian stuff. And, and there it was. And I mean, I, I, I didn't even, when you think of a portal, you think of more like going through like a waterfall or going through like this invisible, uh, you know, like transparent border, <laughs> like a transparent border where, okay, now you're through one to the other. But this portal was more like, like sticking your hand through sand it's so that if you actually went in it, you'd feel stuff. It wouldn't just be crossing a line or walking over a laser beam. It was an actual, it was substantive. It was substantive, meaning that it had like substance to it. Now, again, this is a dream. This is not real life, but this engineer is there. He showed me this portal and it wasn't what you thought it would look like. And his explanation of it on how they derived, how they came to it, how they conceived of it to alter not just the state of matter. I, I forget. He explained the the entirety of how the portal worked in my dream, dreams fleet, so I don't remember the details, but I'm trying to think how he even described it. They, they altered matter, so I don't even want to call it an atom, because who knows if an atom is really an atom, but they altered the building blocks of what are, and since, you know, we say it turns into a wave of possibility, you know, is it a wave, is it a particle that's light? But if, in the end, everything becomes light. But then is light a particle? Is it light a wave? But that didn't even matter. They went actually beyond that. And, and once, once you pierce that, 
that's when this portal began. So I'm trying to remember my dream for you, and it's been like two weeks, so it's, it's definitely faded. But there was a dream of the portal now. All right, and now another dream of portals I had, I had this one about eight years ago. And this one was like a, a good lesson for me. And it's, it's amazing this lesson came in a dream because my waking self at the time never thought about the consequences of a portal. So in the dream, I'm, I'm, I'm on a walk and my best buddy shows up out of a portal. Like the portal arrives like, like Rick and Morty. And he comes out of the portal. He's like, hey, John, bro, I achieved portal technology, bro. You want to? You want to go into the portal? Let's, let's go for a portal ride. You always wanted to do this. And I was like, bro, you, <laughs> where'd you get the portal? He's like, who cares where I got the portal? You want to go into a portal? And I'm like, yeah, Darby, that's great. Hold up, let me, let, me, let me call my wife. Let me let her know I'm going on the portal. He's like, hey, yeah, you might want to just come in the portal with me. You might not want to make any phone calls. It might, you know. I was like, ah, hold up, let me just let her know I'm, I'm going in the portal with you. So in the dream, I, I call her up. I say, hey, uh, buddy's here and... He's got this portal. Uh, I was going to you know, just go with him in the portal for a bit and I'll be home for dinner. And she's like, hey, uh, you sure you want to go in that portal? And I'm like, why wouldn't I want to go in that portal? I mean, how often do you get presented with the opportunity to go into a portal? And she's like, yeah, but do you know how these portals actually work? And I said, man, it's a portal, right? <laughs> she's like, yeah, but what if you never return back here. What if you return back to what you think is your timeline, but it's not my timeline and I'm stuck here without you in my timeline and you may have some alternate version of me and some alternate dimension that you slid into, but in my dimension, I'm still here by myself. So, you know, do you really want to leave me all by myself here in this timeline? And I was like, wow. Well, what a buzzkill. Here I am. I'm about to get to go into a portal, and now I realize there's consequences for this action. And uh, so I, I turned down my buddy. I said, hey, man, it's really cool that you got a portal, but you know, I really, this particular timeline, uh, timeline I'm in right now, I kind of got everything I wanted. That's also what she said. She said, why do you want to even slide into another portal? what is it that you want that you don't have? Don't you have everything that you want in this timeline? And I said, yeah, I do. Why would I portal out of this? Why would I take that risk? I got everything I want. I got it made. I'm going to stick in this timeline. So I didn't go in the portal, but, and that's something you should think about. Now, the thing is, I told this story to a couple other people and they're like, bro, I'd be hopping in that portal right away. I don't have what I want. I'm taking my chances at the next timeline. So, yeah, but if you do, when you get presented this portal to slide into another realm, you realize, do I really want to just take the risk of throwing it all away? Now, other people might say, come on, man, take that risk. But it's like, how much better does it get? So I didn't go on the portal, and that's the interesting aspect of the portal to think about. That's all I'm saying is the portal sounds glamorous, the portal sounds exciting, but you don't really know what's on the other side. Some people will say that's the exhilaration, that's the excitement. And it's like, yeah, but if you got what you want, why would you? So think about it before you hop into a portal is all I'm saying. And that brings me to invisible suits. Invisible suits. Now, I became aware of the invisible suits in 2002. I even made a video, Dude, Where's My Invisibility? In the video, there was, uh, they were shown that in 2002 in Japan, they had invented basically the Harry Potter cloak, the cape that turns you invisible. A little bit later on in the G.I. Joe Rise of Cobra movie, they had the invisibility suit that made them vanish uh, so they could fight without being seen. In the Avengers movie, the helicarrier, uh, Samuel Jackson says, let's vanish. And then in James Bond Die Another Day, 007, he, there was a car that was invisible. Now, the neat part about the car being invisible 
was there was a defense against it and that was you could see the infrared of the vehicle so even if there's an oh and recently there was a show on amazon prime called peripheral which got canceled i don't know why it was a really good show in there there were invisible cars as well and this concept of invisibility is colossally frightening because while you don't have the invisibility someone does and there might be right now as i'm recording this outdoors there might be an invisible car parked right in front of right in front of my house right now and i don't see it i heard stephen greer he used to say he's like yeah there's a bunch of vehicles that are just hovering in the sky that are invisible and i don't know if it was him but it made me think maybe that's why there are flight paths in air traffic control and that's to steer all the flight paths in the same way a division right a division of to border out planes to all go people would say it's for safety but me i think is that they just don't want planes flying over things and if there are a bunch of invisible things hovering in the sky you don't want the planes to accidentally run into these things that are potentially everywhere in the sky that's pretty bananas although in all of my droning you know flying my drone i haven't hit anything but then again i don't know what altitude they hover at perhaps the reason why the drones are ceilinged at 400 feet is because maybe everything that's hovered or parked is above 400 feet i don't know i don't have any proof of that but i'm just trying to plant this idea in your mind that what if there's a bunch of invisible stuff out there now likewise if we could get our hands on some invisibility technology, you know, instead of spending the last 58 years watching football, if we were just figuring out optics and how to make things invisible, then we'd have invisible suits. Imagine what you could do with an invisible suit. And I'm not talking about the, the wrongs that you could do. Because everybody thinks of like, oh, I'm going to go into the girl's locker room. Mm. I'd like to be able to... You, you, could animals see you? You know, do any animals see an infrared? I'd, I'd love it to be able to walk, you know, past ferocious creatures and just see them kind of know. <laughs> like, they'll, they'll know because their nose might sense something. They're like, uh, 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 uh. and they're looking around kind of like the T-Rex the in, in Jurassic Park. They know, or, or the predator, they know something's around, but they can't see it. They could sense it, but they can't see it and you, you could walk around more of the earth without any fear of getting attacked the one thing i realized though is an invisible suit does not prevent you from falling off a cliff from drowning uh from getting cut by sharp branches and stuff like that but at least you could travel to places in remote locations and not worry about getting blow darted by some undiscovered tribe out there so yeah i'd like the invisible suit for the adventure of being able to explore without being seen not necessarily by humans it, not necessarily by civilians okay but by tribes or see i think the military would the militaries of the world probably have the infrared and you know that kind of that's the other thing the invisible suit won't help you in antarctica and that's really the destination we're all trying to get past the ice wall, right? But obviously your heat signature would definitely be detected by any infrared. And that invisible suit's not going to protect you from the cold. So, but invisible suit, just imagine though. Just imagine what you could do with the invisible suit. And imagine that for at least 20 years, there have been people with invisible suits doing invisible things that nobody will see i think i've even had somebody tell me along the lines that they've had an invisible suit and they conducted operations that nobody could see them it's all denied uh but if you know of the stories of the philadelphia experiment where the lingo of the military versus the lingo of the engineers didn't match and when the engineers were told we need to be made invisible to the Germans, they didn't know that it meant invisible to radar and they thought just literal optical invisibility. And the theory is they kind of achieved it 
supposedly by shifting the time field. I don't even know what the time field is, but perhaps that time field is what played into the portal. You know, if you shift the time field then at 45 degrees, does it unlock the portal? And if you shift it 90 degrees, does that create the, uh, the actually, they didn't even create invisibility. They created time travel. <laughs> so, ah, yeah. That's the other part. So if the invisibility is you're shifting through time, I just wanted to introduce this concept of the invisible suit. If you had invisibility, what are the implications of it? What could you do with it? How many invisible things are watching you right this minute? How many invisible things are parked in the sky hovering how many invisible cars are parked in my neighborhood? I don't know. I don't know. So what would you do with invisibility? Would you go into the portal? And do you like borders and division? Or do you just want to merge everything into just this one big cosmic slop? One single blended race. One single blended culture one single blended world don't you like that there's different countries now i don't like that there's countries that are enslaved okay i want to liberate i want to remove the division i guess of their i want to i want to liberate the enslaved but in so doing you're taking away the border of control see I am dividing my tools and dividing my possessions and so I could have greater control over them through the order out of chaos. If we are the possessions of the rulers, they're dividing us but also blending us to meet whatever undisclosed objective that they have. Anyway, hope some of this was food for thought for you. Leave me a comment below. And I'll see you next time. May the force be with you.